So this section I've spent the uh, header on, but this is uh, com solving common problems. So we're going to cover four topics here and then some tie up the loose ends at the end. Um, the four topics we're going to cover are milk supply, sore nipples, thrush, and mastitis. And I don't remember if that's the order I put them in in the slides. I here we go. Low milk supply. Like I said earlier, one in three women who wean prematurely identified low milk supply. The lactation consultants and especially the mom's club facilitators tell us that women perceive their babies to have a low supply because they want to nurse 15 million times a day. So the recommendations to nurse, it, it, what it says on the recommendations is 8 to 12 plus times per day. Most newborns, once they're getting going, <clears throat> may nurse more, much more frequently than 12 times a day. And what we often see is cluster feedings. Nurse for 15 minutes, break for 10 minutes. Nurse for 15 minutes, break for 15 minutes. Nurse for 10 minutes, break for 20 minutes. And it goes on like that for a few hours, and then the baby will have a longer stretch of sleep. But when you're the mom, and you think it's going to be feeding, is these discrete experiences. And like these women said, I mean, that's what I tell people all the time. You feel like your butt is going to grow from the roots of the couch. Because you feel like you're spending all day doing that. It's not, you know, if somebody did a time study, it probably is not as much as it seems. But it's such a profound change in your lifestyle that it really helps to have some information about that. So the whole point of taking a scale to mom's club every week is if some baby is gaining eight ounces a week, that kid, does, that mother has no problem with her supply. And what she's having trouble with is adjusting to the demands of being a new mother, unrealistic expectations about what baby care was going to be, and lack of information about cluster feeding, this concentrated multiple feeds that break and feed like that. Um, so there are a couple of things. Some women will complain that every time I nurse, I get tired. Duh, go to sleep. If the baby goes to sleep, you go to sleep because you don't know when you're going to get your sleep. And <clears throat> this is how I explain it. While the baby was inside you, the baby was eating, being fed 24-7 through the umbilical cord. For the baby to wait two hours is a long time for him. <laughs> and babies don't have blocks. And they've done studies looking at adults, and we put things in our mouths on average every 90 minutes. <laughs> okay? So, help, help the mothers with expectations. Signs of inadequate milk supply. In the 1920s, was the whole scientification of parenting and of feeding and the, and the onset of uh, widespread formula use. And you, you know how our, our profession is. We want to measure everything. <clears throat> how can you know what the baby's getting if you can't tell what's going in? No, you can't tell what's going in. But you can tell what's coming out. <laughs> so babies who gain four to seven ounces a week are vigorous and alert when they're awake and are pooping at least three times a day in the first month. You can count wet diapers too. But the poopy is actually telling, them, telling us much more about what's going on. So we need to educate moms to look at what's coming out. Don't worry about what's going in. If, you, if the baby is nursing and you got this coming out, you're, you're good. So I, I should have put this the other way around. Uh, it's not the law of supply and demand. It's the demand generates the supply. So when the baby's stuck at the breast, Afferent nurse and the signal of the brain, hungry baby, the two signals come back. Oxytocin has released the milk now. Prolactin is make it make more tomorrow. So anybody who's truly having a problem with supply needs to nurse more often. <clears throat> we have a high prolactin level after birth that goes on for a number of weeks and gradually declines over time. However, each time we nurse, there is a pulse of prolactin and a pulse of oxytocin. And in fact, there can be multiple pulses in a single feeding. Every time one of those pulses come down, it's stimulating more supply. So it is far better to nurse 20 times for five minutes 
than 100 minutes once because you're going to get more of those pulses. So frequency is the key. Avoiding engorgement, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. And the lactin receptor theory. Um, we don't really know all of why this happens, but the early breastfeeding frequency or pumping frequency if mother and baby are separated probably increases some receptors within the breast for prolactin. Meaning that every prolactin pulse and surge down the road is going to have a greater impact on the supply. So there really is something critical going on those first couple of weeks. And what I tell moms is to nurse every two hours while you're awake for the first week. More is fine, but every two hours while you're awake for the first week. Because that is going to stimulate a bountiful supply. What there, there is a study that showed that the number of feeds on the second day predicts whether or not people are breastfeeding in four months. Um, so I talked about wet nurses and triplets, uh, less breastfeeding frequency, yada, yada, yada. Um, so I talk about a bountiful supply of milk, abundant milk. I mean, give them an image that says this translates into that. And as I was trying to point out in the video, the licking, kneading, rooting, suckling, all that stuff, that skin-to-skin -skin contact is doing the same thing. There, is, there are stretch receptors beneath the nipple, behind the areola, that also trigger more robust pulses of prolactin and oxytocin but just the skin to skin will help. Facilitate oxytocin release. Um, things that can impair oxytocin release include fear, pain, stress, and embarrassment, just like love making and other, those other activities. You know, you don't want to get a massage if you have fear, pain, stress, or embarrassment, or you don't want to be making love in the same kind of situations. So helping the mother to be comfortable what is that going to, what does she need to feel comfortable? <clears throat> Snuggling, resting, skin to skin, privacy, shoulder ripple. Create an atmosphere of comfort and confidence. <coughs> um, anybody get through medical school with the help of Frank Nether? <laughs> uh, he's, he's great. Um, engorgement. <coughs> Tight breasts with the alveoli taut with milk will down-regulate milk production. So milk stasis and pressure in the alveoli destroys them and begins involution of the ones of the alveoli that are destroyed. So keeping the breasts empty by nursing frequently will increase production. The way that you prevent bad engorgement is to keep the milk flowing. Because engorgement is three things. The increase in the milk flow, so there's more milk in the breast, increased perfusion, vascular congestion, and increased edema related to the lymphatics. The lymphatics and the vascular congestion goes down after about two weeks, and women are afraid they've lost their milk, when all they've lost is the swelling. So that's something that, you know, if the baby's gaining, if it's alert and vigorous, it's pooping, we don't care if your breasts are softer. And you want to avoid that taut feeling. So this is not like the jug of milk in the refrigerator. That this jug is full, I got it out, I've got enough milk. Okay? This is more like water coming down a stream. And you're playing at the stream bed. And between feedings, you're goofing around at the stream bed, making your little dam. And some of the water gets held back. And then you break the dam down. And the water flows fast for a while because you just broke the dam there's still more coming, always. The breasts are never truly empty, and letting them fill up is counterproductive to a good supply. Medical reasons for a poor supply, profound anemia, hypothyroidism, Shan syndrome, hypoplastic breasts is really pretty rare. Those women will describe no growth during the pregnancy, no engorgement, and the classic hypoplastic breasts look like snoopy nose or tubular breasts. Um, and the picture, cosmeticsurgery.com. It's the best place to find good pictures of hypoplastic breasts. There are um, other medical conditions associated with more breastfeeding difficulties. 
But to tell you the truth, I don't really want to highlight them because I don't think it's productive in inspiring confidence. It's variable, and the effect is more subtle than these things which can have a, a, a larger impact. Sore nipples, common but not normal. Um, okay, so there was a period of time when breastfeeding was being, um, the resurgence of breastfeeding in the late 70s and early 80s, where it was common knowledge that sore nipples was normal, and you just had to put up with it, and it was three or four weeks of sore nipples, you just you know, gritted your teeth and got through it. Um, Christina Smiley is a physician lactation consultant who's devoted that her whole work is lactation. Um, and she talks about being in the comfort zone. She says, sore nipples are sort of like having a pebble in your shoe. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. You don't keep walking with a pebble in your shoe. You try to figure out what the problem is and get the pebble out. So I try to convey to people that yeah, your breasts may be a little surprised having all this sucking and they've never done this before. But the reality is that sore nipples are not normal and you don't just put up with it. Because that pain is going to reduce the oxytocin pulses, which is going to reduce the letdown, which is going to create the appearance of inadequate milk. So, causes of sore nipples? Poor latch, poor latch, poor latch, poor latch. Down the line come thrush, suck dysfunction, meaning a discombobulated oral uh, tongue coordination. Uh, uh, resumption of ovulation, new pregnancy, tongue tie or short frenulum, I can't say that other word, um, contact dermatitis, Raynaud's, psoriasis. So, first thing is poor latch. And when I was a little late week leader, if somebody called with sore nipples, I did not want to talk to them on the phone. Forget it. Because you say, the baby has to open their mouth wide. If they think this is open their mouth wide. Have you seen your baby yawn? Does it open its mouth wider than that? Yes. Okay, this is why. You can't do it on the phone. It's not, and it's not a five minute thing. What's a good latch? <coughs> okay. In our bottle feeding culture, we try to put breasts into babies. Okay? Reorient. Bring the baby to the table. To is here. Don't try to put the food there. Bring the baby to the table. When the baby has a good latch, it will open its mouth wide like a yawn, take a huge mouthful of breast, and the nipple will float deep in the baby's throat as the tongue is massaging the milk and the baby is sucking to draw the milk out. When the nipple is in the front of the mouth, as the baby's moving his tongue and jaw, the nipple is going to rub. And that means it's not in the right place. Good latch, deep in the baby's throat. So you can see here in the front of the mouth, tongue or palate <coughs> rubbing on the tip of the nipple, deep in the baby's throat, floating back toward the pharynx. Breast feeding, not nipple. Transient sore nipples up to 30 to 60 seconds may occur as the baby draws the nipple deep into his throat. Some babies do the uh, spaghetti noodle slurp to get the, a deep latch. Um, you know, the mother can put up with that or not, but eventually the baby will probably just go for it. Uh, but some babies do do a spaghetti slurp. So if it's not comfortable in 30 to 60 seconds, take the baby off. On a zero to 10 scale for pain, we're talking a two or a three. Anything higher than a three, start over. I tell mothers, this is an opportunity to start disciplining your baby. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't run in the street. Yes, you can run in the playground. No, you can't run in the street. Yes, you can play in the yard. No, you can't nurse if it hurts. Yes, you can nurse if it feels comfortable. No, you can't nurse if it hurts. Yes, you can nurse if it feels comfortable. They'll get it. And the more consistently the mother can gently and, you know, assertively take the baby off the breast, calm the baby down and start over, the quicker the kid's going to get it. When they allow the baby to nurse on a sore nipple, the baby's like, hey, my mom doesn't mind. It's working for me. <laughs> so the consistency of the message she gives her child is the first way to give gentle, loving guidance. Hey, you could have kind of language on her not quite 
off from the latch. I went on the internet and I looked through hundreds and hundreds of images to look for a great latch. I'm going to tell you what is right about this latch, but I'm going to tell you what's wrong about it. The nose, almost the chin, are touching the breast. The lips are flanged outward. The baby has a pretty good wide open mouth. You can't see much of the areola. It's almost all disappeared into the mouth. Breast feeding, not nipple feeding. But you can't find any good pictures of a good latch because when it's a good latch, you can't really see anything. <laughs> You know, like cheeks, and the baby's all <coughs> cuddled up close. So a good latch looks like this. Rounded cheeks, flanged uh, <coughs> lips, areola missing, hands kind of cupping the breast. Um, babies don't nurse so well like this. Okay, how do you do drink in your drink like this? Not so good. When they're trying to take a big mouthful of breast, they actually need their heads to drop back a little bit. If you take a giant, you know, Dagwood kind of sandwich, remember like this, take a bite on a Dagwood sandwich, you go like this, right? <laughs> right? So give the baby a chance to let the, the head and neck drop back so the chin and the mouth really can't open fully to take a good mouth from the breast. Sore nipples must be evaluated in person by someone skilled to make a thorough assessment has the time and patience for the baby's slow dance steps and the new mother's limited ability to integrate instruction. Oxytocin makes us really slow to learn information and really fast to form relationships. Um, IBCLC, there's the phone number, 5480. Emily Nichols is listed if you, you can't find lactation in the directory, I tried today, oh. but you're listed. Oh. So you can look for Emily Nichols at the lactation department. Maybe you want to ask the phone people to change it to change lactation. That would be great. <laughs> because uh, Elaine's list is 2140. Um, pumping, a break from breastfeeding, nipple shields, and nipple creams do not fix the causes of sore nipples. They might soothe. It may be something less painful than direct nursing at the moment, but it doesn't fix anything. Please don't prescribe these things without making sure you're getting this. And if you can, if you see something really obvious, you know, if the lady has sore nipples and she's nursing with her baby on her lap, with the ventral surface of the baby out to the room, you could say, why don't you try this and see how it feels? And if that fixes it, you can send her on her way. But if it's more than that, you know, there's some help. Okay, thrush, candidate infections. Ask the right questions. Antibiotics recently are in labor. And you have to think this is sort of a circular problem. And you have to think up and down and left and right. Up for the baby. Oral thrush, white patches on the tongue and mouth, irritability of the breast. Mother, sore nipples after a period of comfortable nursing. She's been doing great. Now it hurts? What's the deal? <coughs> Deep breast pain, shooting, burning pains that radiate through the whole breast, lasting up to 30 minutes after a feed. Uh, diaper rash on the baby on the bottom, vaginal yeast effect infections, particularly if they're recurrent. Be more alert if the mother's had um, a yeast infection late in pregnancy. Please do treat people at nine months of pregnancy for yeast infections so the baby's picking up less on the way out. But you don't need all those things. No, you do not need to have all these things. And the reality is that most breastfeeding professionals diagnose thrush by symptoms in the mother. Or if the baby has symptoms or signs and the mother has any complaint, treat them. They always have treat them both. Treat both. Mother and baby for full two weeks, even if the symptoms ease in two to three weeks, I mean two to three days. Um, and I put a star there because uh, people in breastfeeding are wanting to change the paradigm shift. And this should be easy for the family physicians. But the mother babies are a dyad. They are still a unit. Um, that the well-being of one and the well-being of the other, they're sharing an immune system effectively. 
Um, they are one unit. So if there's thrush in one, there's going to be thrush in the other. Um, if you're comfortable, I'm very comfortable treating both patients. Whether or not you want to notify <coughs> the other provider or you're comfortable, not comfortable, call the other provider, whatever, but please get both of them treated. Um, and uh, it's very helpful to eliminate Canada from fomites, bras, pacifiers, breast pumps, clothing, toys, <coughs> yada yada. Lactation can be that. That's also available online from uh, the late Julie. Okay, treatment is to apply topicals after each feed, systemic treatment, systemic. Uh, topical symptoms, topical treatment, systemic symptoms, systemic treatment, 14 days. Um, the apothecary pharmacy downtown will make up Dr. Jack Newman's, who's a Canadian physician dedicated to breastfeeding, all purpose nipple ointment, APNO, which includes Bactroban, Betamethasone, and Myconazole, which sort of can help take care of um, new nipple problems that you're not quite sure what it is because occasionally it is bacterial or occasionally it is a dermatitis or whatever. Um, so you can use all-purpose nipple appointment. Um, and you do have to tell them Jack Newman's APNO and then they make it up in a one ounce tube. It's $55. It's not covered by most insurance because it's a tier three because it's a compounded product. The myconazole gel probably adheres a little better than my statin suspension, so you can use that baby on mom. Thrush, except when it's not. Occasionally, bacterial overgrowth is fat aureus on the nipples to cause the pain. So if you have uh, thrush unresponsive to antibiotics and it doesn't quite fit because it's not in the baby, um, consider a course of antibiotics for the mom. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Does any of the pediatrician make my mom? Can you ever no. get it around here? I don't know. I haven't tried. Okay. Um, but you guys mostly use my statin suspension. That's what I mostly use too. But the, the rationale when I was reading up for this made sense to use a gel. I think that, a the other thing that it helps, I think, is if you have the mom wipe the mouth out after feeding with gauze or clean. Because a lot of times they can't even get it to the surface. Right. So I don't know if you guys yeah. instruct that way, but yeah. I think it's helpful. And recalcitrant cases can be treated with gentian violin. Violent, not violent. <laughs> it makes the mother baby look funny, but, but um, sometimes with furies when nothing else seems to be helping. It's, it's, not, so easy easy it's, it's not easy to get. It's not easy to get. It's not so easy to get because I had one mom who really wanted it, and I think we tried four pharmacies and she finally gave up. She didn't oh, want my oh, hand. She wanted to drink violet, so I said okay. And we tried four places, and this was maybe like two or three years ago. And she might have better luck with brown girl. girl. Okay, mastitis. Um, stay with me for this. So, sore breasts have a diagnostic continuum. Engorgement, the vascular and lymphatic congestion, early postpartum, gradual onset, bilateral, generalized. Temperature can be as high as 100 but the mom basically feels well except for the rocks on her chest. Treatment, get the milk flowing and empty the breasts. And sometimes it can be hard to get the milk flowing at first because they're so congested, it's almost like it's crimping the, the uh, ducts. So if getting in the shower and massaging and just getting the milk to flow, pumping, anything, whatever it takes to get the milk flowing, they'll be on the other side of that. Plug duct. And I have, I have a cloth breast at home and I forgot to bring it. Um, so one of the ducts for one of the lobules has a plug in it, like a sort of solidified curdled milk, okay? Um, and so there's milk behind that duct. Grad occurs a gradual onset, happens after feedings, maybe once, maybe twice, maybe over and over, unilateral, <coughs> definitely localized, temperature less than 101, mom feels well, get the milk flowing into the breast. Mastitis, blocked milk flow with infection. Abrupt onset, more than 10 days postpartum. Rarely you'll see it earlier. If there's bad nipple trauma, skin germs get into the stroma of the breast and they've got a more generalized mastitis. Quick, they're very sick, they feel like crap, and it's because the crap nipple was the portal of entry for germs. Most mastitis past 10 days is in a lobule of the breast. Uh, unilateral, localized, they're sick. Temperature more than 101, feels ill, flu symptoms. Get milk flowing, empty the breast. 
rest, 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 and antibiotics. Ruth Lawrence, who's like the prima donna pediatrician breastfeeding uh, expert in the country, puts in her book, rest is mandatory, capital letters. So causes of plug ducts and mastitis. And nursing indiscretion, this is a allegedly <laughs> word. Um, missed feedings, babies suddenly sleeping through the night, unexpected baby separation, missed pumping sessions, exacerbated by fatigue and stress, can be precipitated by a tight bra or constriction of the breast. And a lady just the other day who got a mastitis when she switched to an underwire, she goes, I don't think I should be using the underwire. And the underwires don't bother everybody, but it can be a cause. Nipple fissure, already talked about that as an early mastitis. Type A personality, attempts to keep going at the same pace during the two postpartum period. We have two of those out there right now, and, and I, I know they both have read the Riot Act, and they're trying to keep up their pace of life that they had before, and they're not listening to their bodies. Their bodies are telling them, you're doing too much. Sit down, rest, hold your baby. Um, so if any of those people are in your sphere, please reinforce the message. Um, it's not realistic to keep going. Uh, most other cultures have a baby moon. Uh, Amish women get 10 days in bed. It's their only vacation their whole lives. That's why they have 13 children. It's their only vacation. <laughs> 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 All other women come and take care of them. In the Netherlands, you have a home visitor who comes and does laundry and takes care of the kids and makes tea to every day for 10 days. Make sure breastfeeding is going okay. Other countries have extended maternity leave. We do not honor this reproductive work women are doing. So we need to affirm that they're doing reproductive work, and you are being productive sitting on the couch. And it's a real change in lifestyle, but it's a short-term thing, and you're doing the very best thing for your baby. Gastitis. Ten full days of antibiotics to prevent relapse and abscess. People are going to feel better in two days. Ten days of antibiotics to treat them well. Dicloxacillin is, has the highest activity against methicillin-sensitive staph aureus, which is the most common germ. Clindamycin covers mold, many community-acquired nurses. Erythromycin, Azithromax, or Azithromycin, uh, Bactrim. Um, the Bactrim's a little less effective with abscess, and Keflex doesn't have great tissue levels in the breast. So, you know, stay with those two unless you have a specific reason to go down the list. Um, if people have recurrence or are not markedly improved, 48 hours and culture the milk, but don't culture milk routinely, it's not worth it. <coughs> Treatment with mastitis, draining the milk, and emptying the breast, hasten resolution to prevent breast abscess. Abrupt weaning with mastitis is one of the biggest causes of abscess. Okay, so we're coming to the end of our program. I actually got through this quicker than I thought, so I will finish up with a couple of things. Uh, I want to answer questions. I want to go through what's in your packet because some of that is the resources to fulfill our baby-friendly steps, and I want you to know what's in the packet. Um, and I do want you to do a meaningful evaluation so that I can learn something from you about what you need and what worked and what didn't work for you today. So I want you to be especially aware of the third week morale meter. Is there an official term for this? Hitting the is wall. It, is it in your literature? <laughs> well, all these things are kind of happening at the same time. Fatigue peaks, the initial family support people had lessons, uh, returning to work is looming, and women are starting to freak out, how am I ever going to be able to do it? The breast soften is congestion and edema ease, and so they have a false sense of declining supply. Postpartum depression may be worsening, Fussiness may increase, and cluster feedings overwhelm just before feeding efficiency improves. If you hear from a mom between, you know, a week and three and a half weeks, she is a vulnerable mom. The way I describe it to people is when we open our bodies, we are also opening our hearts for our babies to come our lives. And for, our walk, for a while, our bodies are still open as the uterus is involuting and we're healing and whatnot. And I think there is an especially acute emotional sensitivity in this time. A sensitivity that serves us to be sensitive to our babies and learn their cues. 
and makes us sensitive to the emotional tenor of what's going on and fall in love with our babies. But it makes us less well able to cope with stuff. So, like the moms were saying here, they, they, they really emphasized when they were talking to me and they had a few less than flattering things to say about some of the <coughs> comments they'd had in the past. And they really wanted to be positive. But they said that our comments in this time can be the thing that keeps them going and helps them turn the corner, or it can be a devastating thing to their confidence and their ability to take the next step. And I just want to reinforce how much one sentence can mean to her. Um, and helping people get plugged into the resources of them. I just said that. Um, so when you're completing evaluation, please include questions you wish I'd answered. If you want requests for resources, books and references, suggestions for improvement, uh, I'm, I'm planning to take the questions you ask and put them in a frequently asked questions thing and send it back to you because you're sure to have things that I didn't respond to. And so these four problems that we talked about, uh, Sore nipples, low supply, <coughs> mastitis, and rush. I'll send you some cookbooks that kind of resources to that piece. Um, and then I want to finish with this. Rudy sent me this. Um, and I was really excited to get it. And I want you to pay attention because there's somebody you know in this. Well, Heidi's fixing this. It's, if there's anyone that hasn't signed in, feel free, uh, be sure you to do it before you, yeah, before sign you in. leave. Okay, so let me just go through what's in your packets and then I'll finish with that. Okay, um, I would love to see public breastfeeding become more common and more accepted here. Because I, I really believe a picture's worth a thousand words. We learn to breastfeed by watching other mothers do it. You didn't learn how to ride a bike, reading a book. You don't learn how to ballroom dance, reading a book. Give me a break. We have to be able to see other mothers doing it. And I'm, I'm proposing, put it out there now, that we harness some of the women, young women and the faculty of the um, Keene State College Nutrition and Health Sciences Department and the Monadnock Breastfeeding Coalition and think about a project for our community to get these stickers on the doors, doors of places all around. So if you'd like to have one on, you know, in your office, in your clinic, stick it up. For your car. <laughs> uh, about the lactation consultants and the services they offer. When to call for help. Mothers get these when they go home from the hospital. A little blurb about the... Um, Mom's Club. Uh, unfortunately, there's not an active relation league group in within driving distance, um, but the support groups that are available, there is. Where? Yeah, brand new. I don't have her name yet, but there is one. Where? Great. A, a former leader is going to be there for support. Um, so the groups that we currently know of that are available. Um, I would like to just thank and commend the uh, Baby Friendly Committee for their work on our policy. It's still in draft form. There's a few tiny little edits and then it goes online. Uh, I wanted to have the full article on the burden of uh, suboptimal breastfeeding. Um, this is a proposal for a prenatal education uh, advantages of breastfeeding handout. Uh, Surgeon General's call to action and the AAP breastfeeding statement. Um, one of the things that moms in the group um, said um, is really hard for them is that right in a year, support for breastfeeding disappears. Um, social support, public support, family support, and a lot of times uh, health provider support. Um, the advantages of breastfeeding don't go away in a year. It's that the baby's need is most critical at one year, up to one year. Um, but the baby and the moms continue to benefit as 
long as they both want to. Um, and CDC, World Health Organization, recommends at least to two years. Yep. And Antonia Novella also recommended, when she was Surgeon General, recommended two years. Oh, in all the papers, oh, two years. I, yeah. I just want to add too that you know it, it, it in my role um, trying to link what you all do with the community's needs. It, it, this concept of it takes a village to create a nursing generation is very true. And so HEAL, which stands for Healthy Eating, Active Living in New Hampshire, actually is supported with some funds, a coalition in town that's been meeting, as well as some of the materials like bumper stickers and the uh, and the, and the uh, window decals and. Uh, I, I hope to, to tap this group in the future around advocacy for breastfeeding because we're also going to start approaching businesses with you know making uh, breastfeeding support sort of a necessary component of our wellness plan in the business, and it will help if we can you know tap uh, provider expertise as as advocates for that. So you're part of a much bigger effort than simply the care of the individual patient that comes to see you. And I just want you to. I appreciate that, and I hope some people saw the article that was in the paper this past week. Yeah, if week. anybody was wondering about that quote about they should be alone, that was not exactly what I said. <laughs> <laughs> what I said was, <laughs> everything else about the article is great, but of course, you know, you're really sensitive about the misquote. Mm -hmm. What I said was, in that first hour after birth is not the ideal time to be passing the baby to all the family members. That first hour really ought to be Body is the baby's natural habitat. And I think that article, though, but it, other than it, that, it was as good as an article can be in terms of a, a, a person seeing the conversation. Okay. okay. I carried my love around in a paper bag, and when it began to storm, it tore a hole, the contents spilled out onto the ground, and then she came around, oh, oh. the marbles and paper planes came tumbling down, she took them all away, let's play a better game. Oh, catch me if you can, I'm the smile on the moon, and I am here for you. Oh, da 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 that you could love This is a place you can call your home Home da 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 Well, I never put much stock into the stars Never put much faith into the face Never put much stock into the star I'm wondering Yeah.
Because some people, some people who are just who don't, you, you know, don't have known abuse histories are just like, oh, it's icky. I'm like, well, you can always try it. If you hate it, you can stop. But with people with abuse histories, I'm always much more tentative about doing any sort of pressure as far as breastfeeding goes. Well, obviously, people who have a sexual abuse history have been pressured to do other things against them. Right, right. So if we can frame it as an invitation right. that this tender, vulnerable infant is being protected by your giving of your son. Oh, that's a good that it's your, you will learn along with your baby that nurturing touch is not necessarily sexual and can be very, very safe. Um, I mean, I, I think we have to approach it at whatever level people are at and looking for a closer connection, whether it's more holding, whether it's skin to skin, whether it's breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. We're gonna we're gonna have a positive impact on their mothering capabilities. I just wanted to publicly recognize Heidi and the mm -hmm. committee. This a ton of work and time went into this. And uh, I There are only three other hospitals in the state who currently have been able to do that. And th this has always been our biggest hurdle to get there. So thanks to all of you for yeah, thank you so much for coming. Day, but thank you so much. 